yeah so we have one live now and i i am waiting for the signal from my daughter uh, to check if the audio and the video are okay what if what if we get some questions yeah. in, in in the chat can we take them or not uh, no i generally don't take the questions okay. because uh, uh, okay. are we getting okay uh so i think uh everything is fine so and now we begin okay okay so uh good morning or good afternoon or good evening everyone depending on where you are and welcome to today's conversation on philosophical post humanism theory praxis and future we are honored to have with us francesca ferrando so uh, let me begin by introducing our honorable guest francesca ferrando teaches philosophy at nyu liberal studies new york university she has a phd in philosophy ma in gender studies and is a leading voice in the field of post human studies and founder of the global post human network She has been the recipient of numerous honors and recognitions, including the Sainetti Prize with the acknowledgement of the President of Italy. She publishes extensively, and her latest book is Philosophical Posthumanism, which was published in 2019. Francesca is a posthuman philosopher, a best-selling author, and an avant-garde performer who likes to experiment in all kinds of intellectual and artistic expressions. to achieve full existential awareness in the history of ted talks she was the first speaker to give a talk on the topic of the posthuman us magazine origins named her among the 100 people making change in this world a very warm welcome to you madam and thank you for accepting my invitation to be here with us today. thank you so much sura for your invitation for your work It's a great honor and a joy to be here today with you and with all the people that are connecting. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. So we jump straight into the questions without I mean, biding much time. So let me begin. Uh, so if I start at the very beginning, let me begin by asking you, what is posthumanism? What is posthumanism? Or to be more specific, I am not asking for a definition. but simply trying to understand what kind of human are we talking about of which the post humanism is a post is it the human that was the socio historical construct of the politically powerful societies or is it humans that a uh, human that was an anthropological development uh, say from the homo erectus to the homo sapiens so your views on that Thank you so much Sura for your question very important question. So let me start by explaining that um, I define posthumanism as the philosophy of our time. In this sense it's a movement which includes a lot of uh, different school of thoughts, a lot of thinkers from all continents who are really rethinking what does it mean to be human in the 21st century. So there are a lot of different school of thoughts I'm going to mention some but definitely I could mention many more there is going to be posthumanisms transhumanism plural antihumanism new materialism object oriented ontology there are there are a lot of different movements all of them agree that the human is an open notion that should not be taken as a clear uh, specific construct but that it's a, a, a work in progress In this sense it's very interesting what you say. So what what kind of post slash human are we talking about? More specifically what kind of human are we talking about? So I have to give you different answers. According to the transhumanist approach we are talking about a post to the traditional biological definition of the human. In this sense the human for instance being an open notion being a bridge it's something that can be worked with uh, for instance transhumanism really focuses 
on uh, what they call human enhancement. So for instance, they say, of course, the notion of the enhancement is a little tricky. For some people, some traits could be positive. For some others, some traits could be negative. But in general, most people would agree that having a disease is not a good thing, that death, a lot of people are not really looking forward to die. So most transhumanists are really focusing on, for instance, uh, radical life extension. So humans used to live 30 years for many, many, many thousands of years. Now we got to a longer lifespan, but they're talking really radically expanding this lifespan. Uh, so some people are talking about 800 years, some people are talking about 1,000 years, and some people are talking about unlimited lifespan. For instance, Aubrey de Grey, who says, I'm not going to say you, you know, we should live whatever, 2,000 years, and say like, why don't we go for an unlimited lifespan by, for instance, constantly regenerating our body through nanotechnology, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is, for instance, a transhumanist approach to the idea of the post to the human. Hmm? So to the post of what has been considered, biologically speaking, human. Of course, you could debate that in the history of the human, something like, for instance, immortality has been there for a very long time. Think, for instance, all, all Chinese uh, philosophy. Think, for instance, of uh, one of the first mythologies that we have, Gilgamesh, that is all about the search for immortality. So, you know, there are some uh, discussions about, well, one of the goals of being human is constantly going beyond the borders of what has been considered human until that point. But in general, post-human, according to a transhumanist approach, will be really going beyond what we consider historically human. There are other examples. For instance, um, you could think of species that are no longer human. This is, again, according to transhumanism, you can think, for instance, of uh, uh, something like mind uploading. So, for instance, you have a machine in which human consciousness has been uploaded. Now you have a kind of a hybrid, kind of a chimera, because you have a robotic yes. body with a between the little comma human consciousness. So this could be an interesting example of a post-human being. So a being that is, uh, let's say, genealogically related to the human, but no longer human because humans in the history of humankind have been biological. Now you have a robotic one. So there are many other examples. Another example would be, for instance, species, humans who migrate to other planets. For instance, Mars is a good candidate. There is a lot of discussion about life on Mars. For instance, according to NASA, we are going to be living there by 2029. Now things might change you know, with, with the pandemic and everything that is happening, but definitely it's a goal that many uh, research companies have in mind, that having some humans eventually move to Mars and, Mars and live there. Now, let's say that some of these humans are going to move to Mars and not come back. It's not, you know, it's not an easy a journey and it's not a, you know, a cheap one. So let's say that they stay there and they stay there and generation after generation, you're going to start to see a species evolving, uh, adapting to the condition of Mars. It could be that eventually the species could no longer generate with humans who stayed on Earth, and then you're going to see a species that, again, it's genealogically uh, related to the, to the human, genetically related to human, but it's not, mm. no longer human. You see this, you know, like you were mentioning Homo erectus a lot in the history of the Homo family. Mm? So yeah. these are all possibilities that are connected to a near future. So transhuman is not really talking about a, a far future. It's also talking about a far future, but also a very close future. Mm? So we're talking about a close future and a far future. Then we have another approach, which is posthumanism. And posthumanism says, well, we don't really look, we don't really need to look so you know like far ahead. We don't really need to look to the future to understand what is what the posthuman is. So that the so posthumanism look at history and says, well, history is not really linear, it's more like a cycle. And in this, for instance, Indian philosophy teaches a lot, you know, with the yugas, a lot of ancient philosophies were all about cycles, were not really about the conception of history as linear. And if you think about it, you know, like uh, the seasons come back, you know, like our dreams come back, um, who we are is not, not just a change that is radical, we are no longer who we were when we were kids, but there are, of course, things that are connected to who we were when we were, when we were kids. So we can see a history, you know, as a cycle, as a spiral, so in that sense, to understand who we're going to be, we really need to understand who we are and who we were. 
In that sense, we're going to understand something very interesting. You mentioned two interesting aspects of the human. One is the historical construction of the human, and the other one is the anthropological, paleontological basis of the human. Both of them are very important to understand the posthuman. So on one side, you have a construction that did not apply to all humans. Very simple example, but there are many more, is the history of slavery according to which mm. some humans are, were not considered humans, were considered less than human, subhumans, so that mm. they could be enslaved because you don't enslave other people that are considered human. So in the history of humankind, this comes back a lot. Uh, from the ancient times, according to which some humans were civilized, others were barbarians, think of the Greeks, but also think of all civilizations, Chinese civilization, all of them saw themselves as civilized, and the others outside of the border is barbarians. So those people could be enslaved, those people could be, except could, they were less than human. Mm? So in that sense, we really see the human as a historical construction. But of course, there is also the paleontological question. So what about genetics? Are we a species? So that's a very interesting question because it really allows us on some level to see a non-hierarchical notion of the human mm -hmm. in which we all share DNA. None of us share 100% DNA, but we all share 99.999, so it's a lot. And we're all different, and we're all humans. So I think that DNA, uh, it's a really interesting way to go about the human. And it's also, of course, very interesting to relate in us to the homo family, which is really big. And it's, uh, it's also non-hierarchical. We used to think, uh, for instance, of Neanderthals as those people that were brutish and uh, barbarians and eventually died off and maybe you, you almost had to kill them off. Now we realize that that's not the story at all. Now, the Andertas were, you know, they had their own culture. Uh, they even probably played music. Uh, they had uh, burials. And humans interbred with uh, not only Neanderthals, but many of these homo families that eventually uh, got extinct. So in our DNA, we are not just homo sapiens. We carry a lot of us carry DNAs that are not coming from homo, Africa or homo sapiens. So I think mm. it's very interesting. It gives us a lot of lights about who we are in the sense post-human, in this post-centralized notion of the human, when we realize that the human is a plural notion, that we are many, and that we should not see the human at the center of the story, because the human can only thrive when we are in, in balance with us as a species, and also with non-human species in the planet. And that's where we go and get the three layers of what I like to define post-humanism. Maybe we go through this in other questions, but it would be post-humanism, post-anthropocentrism, and post-dualism. Thank you. Thank you for your very well-worded answer. Uh, so now let me move on to the next question. So you have given seven definitions of post-humanism. Anti-humanism, cultural post-humanism, Philosophical posthumanism, posthuman condition, transhumanism, uh, AI takeover, and voluntary human extinction. Pardon me for saying so, but uh, sounds very complicated and a bit intimidating to the uh, uninitiated. Would you please elaborate on what each means? Yes. So the first thing that I would like to say is um, that uh, you're you're right. Uh, there is a lot going on, and probably we could add more layers, and probably three years from now, we are going to have 20 definitions of the posthuman. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really a movement that is happening, which on one side makes it very exciting, because we are not just talking about something that happened 1,000 years ago, or 300 years ago, or even 50 years ago. It's something that is happening right now in the last two decades, I would say, let's say from the 90s on, and it's really, uh, it's really flourishing in all continents. Uh, we have really groups uh, thinking about this in literally each continent of planet Earth with different nuances, with different perspectives. So on one side, this is very exciting. Of course, the other side, it makes it a little confusing, complicating, create a lot actually of uh, uh, unclearness because eh? some people, you know, think of the posthuman and they're actually referring to transhumanism. Other people are thinking of the posthuman and are actually referring to posthumanism. So this is why at first in my work, I really wanted to bring some clarity because this was the real misconception and real misunderstanding between communities because each of 
this community was referring to the postumer in a different way, and so without really understanding what the other groups were talking about. So part at the beginning, uh, my work started on these topics, like you know, like more than ten years ago. My my goal was okay. Let's first of all, if we want to be in dialogue about this important question, who we are as a species, we need to have a language that is in common. We know language. Interesting the history of Babylon according to the Bible, because Babylon had a lot of wonderful uh, stories, you know, but according to the Bible, it's interesting that the Tower of Babylon, all these languages, and you get all oh, this confusion. Yes. So it's kind of similar what was happening with the posthuman, all these languages, all these nuances, great, and so much, so much confusion. confusion. So first, my work was really, like, okay, let's clarify all of this, acknowledge as many groups as we can, because again, they're constantly flourishing, flourishing. So it's hard mm -hmm. to keep track of all of them. And I'm sorry if I'm not mentioning some other groups that are flourishing at the moment. But it's because we're talking about something that it's happening right now. So it's almost like you are in a field in the spring and there are all these flowers coming out and it's hard to keep track of all the flowers. So they're all beautiful, they're all interesting and all different as well. And all, uh, you know, with different flowers and colors and smells and everything. Now, uh, something that all of these agree is that, as we were mentioning before, the human is not something that can be clearly defined and that is something that is a closed notion. That everyone agrees that that's not the case. The reason why, again, is different. Now, um, it's very important also to uh, understand that once we are in a place where we can understand each other, that's when we are really allowing for a dialogue in which all of our voices are precious. In fact, uh, we need everyone as part of this. And it's interesting because in this uh, movement, there are voices that are actually saying almost the opposite. Um, for instance, uh, the, the, the movement for voluntary extinction, it's a movement that is really saying almost the opposite of what transhumanism is saying. Transhu transhumanism is really, for instance, focusing about uh, human um, enhancing the human. On the other side, you have you know, a movement like the anti-human, which is different than anti-human, is they say like, you know what, let's just get extinct. It would be actually better for the planet. My take on this is that I'm neither a transhumanist nor an anti-human, I'm a post-humanist, which is still bringing other insights to the conversation. So like, you know, uh, yeah, let's not just focus on the human because the human is part of a much wider picture. So we cannot just think of the human alone. And also, yeah, the solution is not human extinction because it's not that we are, you know, if we get rid of us, someone else is going to do better. Let's us become aware of what's happening and, you know, and understand what's happening because for me, it's not a matter of species. species or that would also speciesism. Or now I think that, I don't know, zebras would do better than us or AI would do better than us. I don't think so. It's, mm -hmm. It would be still a top hierarchical. So you see, there is so much going on. These groups are not uh, saying the same things at all, but they do agree in opening the notion of the human, deconstructing the notion of the human for different purposes and for different reasons. Now, for the people who are already into it, my advice is, uh, Try to acknowledge all of these uh, and try to be in dialogue with all of these groups because sometimes, especially some years ago, there were like, you know, like conflicts, you know, one group would not talk to the other. And then for me, it's not mm. helping in any way because we're all part of the discussion. We're all humans. So we really need to re-envision together a human species. And everyone is bringing precious insights. Of course, no one has the perfect vision. We, these are all perspectives. But the most complete perspective is when we get all together talking about it, bringing our own experiences as part of the human species and bringing our own vision as part of the human species. On the other side, uh, for someone who is not part of the discourse, don't get uh, worried. Just take your time, be patient at first. It's going to take you a couple of months, maybe six months to really navigate through all the material, at, you know, with a, not deeply, but to get an understanding, mm. six months to be generous. You can do it in much faster than that, just to get you know, a fast understanding. If you want to get deeper, a little bit deeper into each movement, give yourself, I don't know, three months at least. After three months, you start to get an understanding. Then you start to understand what is your voice is aligning better with. You know, maybe your voice is uh, closer to one movement or the other, and then start to explore more in that movement. And then realize what's missing in that movement because that movement mm. needs your voice. So I would just say, like, no one should get worried, scared about all these, uh, you know, like uh, Babylonian languages coming out. It should be exciting because you understand that you're going to be part of a conversation that it's happening. So you're not just talking about, you know, people who died a long time ago. You are there. 
that's your voice that is wanted. Just make sure, though, please, before entering the conversation, to do a little study. Because what happens, sometimes people jump into the conversation with all the confusion, which was understandable maybe 10 years ago. Not anymore. There is a lot of work that has been done. I'm not only, only talking about my work, but many other people who really took the time mm -hmm. to clarify all of this. So at this point, if you jump into the conversation, say, oh, those terrible posthumanists who, I don't know, just want uh, uh, to enhance the human through nanotechnology, you're getting confused. You're talking about transhumans. So just please do a little homework, not much. Take even one month, do something, please, before jumping in question. But we want your voice. But please don't just get into the confusion because that's not helping anyone. And at this point, it's really outdated. Confusion could be accepted until one, maybe 10 years ago, but now there is a lot of work to be done. So no reasons anymore. A lot of free work out there. You can find it free on Wikipedia, on, on you know, books, oh, articles, well. really easy accessible. So please, please do a little work. And then, yes, we would love to have your voice. Very important. We, we, we need you. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope people who are watching this program will respond to your appeal. OK, moving on to the next question. Uh, is posthumanism merely an intellectual or academic theory, or does it have a practical implication, especially during the time of this pandemic? Has the pandemic crisis pointed out, uh, say, as an epiphanic moment, maybe, the need for this posthumanism? You're so right. Uh, you're so right on this, uh, Sura. You're right. Um, it, um, it started in academia, although that's a relative uh, type of genealogy. We can really set roots much broader than just academia. But let's say that definitely the academia did a very good job outlining a conversation about this, outlining philosophies and ideas and theories that eventually became really much more than that. Um, so there were already conversations about, you know, is this just a theory? Is this a praxis? Is this an existentialism? I mean, there were already conversations, but you're right. COVID-19 really pushed posthumanists to really rethink uh, itself, uh, not only as a movement, but as a philosophy. And at uh, first, when the whole thing started to come down, you know, beginning of 2020, um, for some, some people, you know, like the, there was a kind of a bit of a crisis. Like, what, what is this? Is this going to help me navigating this uh, uh, situation? Let's say that the people who took it just as an academic trend uh, did find uh, uh, some trouble, did, uh, did, could not find uh, uh, too much of a response there. But the people who saw posthumanism as much more than just an academic trend, that saw it as a philosophy going back to the traditional idea of philosophy as a law for wisdom, which is part of all uh, you know, world uh, traditions in China, in India, and in Africa, and ancient Greek, and Greece, and all kinds of traditions have this uh, idea of like wisdom as a key to help you in your existential path. So the people who took it that way, uh, and, and that also was my case, had to be very honest because at that point, you know that you have nothing to lose. And eh? when it really was, you know, like, and it's, you know, it's still very much a real thing and still very serious. Um, in, in my case, I was based in the United States, in New York, the, the big wave came around March. And that's when you realize, oh, you know, like I had friends mm. in China and family in Italy and, uh, and the whole picture started to come out as like, oh, I can die and people that I love can die and people started to get sick. And it was really a matter, not anymore, just writing the next academic paper. It was like, I don't, I'm, I don't know how much time I left on this earth. I just don't know. It might be, it might be one week, it might be one day, it might be 10 years yeah. or it might be 50 years. I just don't know. At this point, what I'm going to do with this time? And what I'm doing already is that important. And I have to be very, very honest because it was not about academia. It was not about uh, getting a job. It's not was not about uh, talking to my student. It's about me and myself and the mirror around myself with social distancing because there is no there was no one left apart from maybe the people you live with that were in their own distress anyway. <laughs> so I had to be completely honest with myself. And I must say that uh, in my case, although I cannot generalize for everyone, in my case, uh, I came out very strong out of this, a simple humanism as an existential type of philosophy that really helped me navigate in this uh, uh, specific uh, uh, historical time. On one side, it made me realize even more 
that we are uh, really one on one level. I, when I say one, I'm not talking one is a, like a monistic approach, one is one, one is many. Eh? I'm talking about a kind of uh, uh, pluralistic approach uh, to monism. There are many philosophies that support this. So the species can be one and we can be many at the same time. But with the pandemic, we realized that, uh, you know, for instance, the virus could, could cross anything, uh, genders, countries, nationality. Of course, we also realized that there was much more going on. So a lot of the social issues that were already there, like classism and, and racism and all this stuff came out as well. So some communities uh, had it harder than the others because yes. the pandemic really brought all the problems that were already there. So it's definitely, uh, like you said, you used a very good word, an epiphany. Uh, it definitely, it's uh, the pandemic, I think it's an epiphanic time. In the sense, uh, it's also a traumatic time. But trauma, mm. uh, when you look uh, at the Greek uh, uh, etymology, means uh, like a wound. And when you have a wound, if you do not take care of it, it can be getting infected and can be very dangerous. But a wound, it's uh, exposing the insides. And like that, this kind of wound expose, it, expose not only social issues, but also individual ones. It was just, again, society with its own issues that eventually was completely exposed. And also us, as individuals, in our existential journey, asking ourselves, all right, as Nietzsche says, if this life was going to come back over and over and over, are you going to do the same things? Are you doing what you need to do? Is your life meaningful? What if you die tomorrow? Are you okay you know, with your life? These were huge questions and are still huge questions. COVID is still going on, big issues for many countries, and even in the countries where it, it, you know, it got uh, less of an issue, it's still an issue anyway. There are waves coming back and people are dying and getting infected, etc. So I think that on one side, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's not an easy time, but on the other side, can be a really rich time for existential inquiry. So if, you, if we're just waiting to go back to normal, it's going to be a very unsuccessful uh, waiting because it's not going to be back to normal. Uh, nothing can be just the way things were. But you know, there were a lot of issues, there are still a lot of issues, and there are also some sides of it that can also be positive for the planet. So we also rely that ecologically speaking, we were really damaging a lot. And now with COVID-19, we are moving less, we are taking planes less, mm -hmm. you know, we are buying less, we are doing a lot of things less. And that's also a good thing. So I would say, you know, in this moment, of course, you know, be extra cautious, uh, treat yourself and others with respect, you know, wear masks, you know, wash your hands, et cetera, et cetera. But also take it as an existential time. If you have the luxury to, to have the chance to think, you know, some people live in overcrowded places when, you know, you don't have yes. space for yourself. But if you do have the, the, the luxury to have some space for yourself, take it because this is a unique historical time. Uh, luckily, pandemics do not come often. <laughs> Hopefully, they were not going to come often <laughs> with, you know, the Anthropocene, we might see this more often, but it's a unique historical time. So let's not just, you know, like see the negatives, which are there, of course, but let's also see this as a rich historical time for our society to see where we are at, for our planet to see where we are at, as for us as individuals. Okay, thank you, thank you. And uh, now moving on to the origin of this post-humanism, do you believe that uh, there was a delusional or even schizophrenic approach which made some societies believe that no material achievement was enough for them and they had to push hard for more and more that led to this post-humanism? So could you repeat the question? Because they, I, they, I got this connection. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. sure. So what I'm saying is that do you believe that there was a delusional or even schizophrenic approach, which made some societies uh, believe that no matter uh, what achievements they have already got, that was not enough, and mm. they had to push for more and more, and that this led to post-humanism. Thank you so much. It's a very good question. Yeah. It goes very well with the question that you asked me before. Yes. You're right. I think that uh, this uh, approach, in which nothing is never enough, uh, mm. they can apply mm. to anything from uh, jobs or money or uh, lovers or possessions or whatever. Let's think, for instance, of money. Uh, money is based on numbers. So li literally, you could always be considered poor because you can always add zeros. 
let's say that you have one thousand dollars for some people you can you could be considered rich for other poor but to one thousand you can add another zero and now you have ten thousand dollars and then you add another zero and then you have one hundred thousand dollars and you keep going with zeros the point is that you have never enough if you go into numbers it becomes an illusion your life if you want and this is also because i'm also critical of transhumanism with the radical life extension i'm not against it but i don't see i don't think that quantity is necessarily the, the, the answer of course, I, I, I'm not, I, necessarily, I don't necessarily have anything uh, against it because if I think about our ancestors, uh, when you were yes. 30, you were considered already old. And by 50, you yes. were considered very old. Not many people would become 50 eh? in the Roman time, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. or the Greek time. So now, you know, someone is 30 is considered pretty young. Someone who is 50 is considered still an adult. And, you know, many people live around, you know, much you know, older than that. So yes. I think that um, you're right with the idea of, of uh, you know, the achievements. When are you uh, fulfilled? When are you satisfied? This is when we really need to think of uh, uh, quantity in relation to quality. And this is when uh, I do think that we were a really uh, becoming a really schizophrenic society. That's why COVID-19 on one side... Uh, Again, I really want to, uh, of course, acknowledge all the trauma and the stress and death and sorrow that is bringing to a lot of humans, including myself. I had people, you know, who are not they got sick. I, I mean, this is including myself. But I also want to acknowledge that COVID-19 was a shock, a wave shock for all of us to stop. We had to stop. There was nowhere to go. We had to stop as a society, as individuals and say, what are we doing? And then when you look at the life before COVID-19, literally nothing was enough. Nothing was enough. Not enough money, not enough jobs, not enough projects. Go, 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 go. Next thing you realize, apart from COVID, we're going to die anyway. So mm. COVID or not, the human life mm. is set by a birth and by a death since the origin. Eh? All the Paleolithic time, which is 99% of our human history, uh, are uh, in, uh, you know like em embracing the fact that life and death are part of the same cycle. So apart from COVID, eventually that is going to that is going to come. But as a society, we were erasing it. We were like forgetting about it. We didn't want to talk about it. It's not there. If I don't see, it's not there. So I think mm. that uh, you know COVID nineteen and that uh, side also it's really a wake up call. Should be a wake up call. Of course, it doesn't have to be. People can just live in the illusion of living forever. Even if you're going to have a radical life extension, you're not going to live forever. Even if you live hundreds of thousands of years, eventually yes. everything changes. Everything eventually move on to something else. Even species get extinct, extinct. So it's really important to acknowledge this and really realize that the question is, yeah, how much is enough? How much do you want and why? And it's because the society looking at you and you're just living in the eye of others. And that's a criticism, for instance, that Heidegger gives us. What kind of life are we living? Is that an authentic life? And what does it mean, an authentic life? Heidegger was an Ichian scholar, so it was very much based on you mm. and your own take on your own life. So not, not so much living for what your mother or father or, or husband or wife or, or friends are, you know, like uh, tell you that you should do, but what is really valuable to you, because you are the only one who has the answer to your own life? No one else, because you're a unique person. Yes, you're related to the species. Yes, you're, you're a part of the planet, but you also are a completely unique person. Your DNA is unique, even if, even if you have twins, even if you have, uh, someone getting is, is cloned, their DNA is still unique because of epigenetics, the way that uh, the DNA unfold, depending on the diet, on where you live, on your habits, so everyone, even genetically speaking, is completely unique. Okay, not completely, we share a lot, but still the, the final outcome is unique. So it is very important to really stop and take this gift on some level. Again, I want to acknowledge all the sorrow with, with, with COVID, but also let, let's acknowledge the wake-up call. And let's take this wake-up call because it's not going to happen. Uh, I mean, I think that eventually this period is going to end. And we, mm. and many people are just ready to jump back to the, the wheel, like the little mice running, mm. running, running, running until we're gone, you know? And that's fine. If that's the life we want to live, it's okay, you know? But it's, you know, there are questions, existential questions that come constantly. 
since you know since we start to be able to bring questions to life very young kids ask why what is this and you know when we're going to die i don't know if we're going to be worried about how many projects we did or how many mm. uh, you know degrees we had but more the kind of life we had and the insights we got through this life so i would you know really urge everyone to take this moment not only you know as a moment of uh, intensity uh, for humankind but also a moment to really inquire into the self inquire into your own existential quest yeah thank you thank you for explaining it so well okay so moving on like uh, next what i'd like to ask you is that is post humanism a theory or philosophy or approach that believes and propagates that the world was not created for the human species but the human species was meant to be a part of the different species of the world and each being equally important or in other words what i'm trying to say is that does post humanism believe that the human species is a product of the earth not master of it we should coexist in correlation with the other species not by subjugating or exploiting them what would be your views it's such a beautiful question surav um very beautiful thank question you. thank you yes so you're right there are some uh, approaches um that could be philosophical or religion religious that see for instance the human as the one in charge uh, for instance if you think uh, of the bible it does talk about the human being created in the image of god uh, and for this reason some people you know gave a primacy to the human although i also have to say that a lot of jewish and christian scholars are also saying well God was also talking the only language that human could understand at the time. So it doesn't mean that that you know that was the language that human were were able to understand at the time. At the time, in a time where human were not the center of the earth yet, human were at risk of a lot of diseases. Uh, they were still prey of many other animals. Mm -hmm. So we still had an anthropocentric type of approach that did not reflect an anthropocentric uh, uh, primacy of the human on earth yet. So you can also you know think that, uh, uh, you know, if you believe in God, God is talking to the human in a way that human can understand. There are other philosophies and approaches that mm, never place the human at the center. For instance, uh, Taoism is a very interesting one. It's very ancient. Um, the Upanishads also are, uh, you know, there, there is, it's, it's interesting because there are some approaches, for instance, in Hindu and Buddhist philosophy that see, for instance, the human as a, a plus in the process of rebirth or reincarnation. But if you look at many other texts, also in the Hindu and in the uh, Buddhist tradition, the human is really thought as part of the uh, manifestation of the unfolding. And in that sense, you know, we're all these, now if we look at the Hindu tradition, in, for instance, in the big game of Lila, and where manifestation mm. itself is playing with, with itself, or with themselves, let's use the plural. And it is a cos cosmic game. And in this cosmic game, we are the players and the played, and we're all part of this together. Now, in that sense, uh, um, post-human is definitely uh, does not uh, acknowledge the human as a, a privileged species in any way. Uh, it does acknowledge that maybe uh, it is also important to realize that at one point, maybe the construction of an anthropocentric narrative was important for the human to acknowledge themselves. Think, for instance, at the time where humans were uh, almost getting extinct during the Paleolithic time, we almost got extinct because during yes, the Ice yes. Age. So maybe you have at one point the need to say we are special, we need to survive. Uh, you know, we, we, you know we, we, we want to stay on this planet. We are part of this and we need to recognize some type of uh, uh, importance to the anthropocentric language and narrative. But that's no longer the case anymore. We don't need an anthropocentric approach anymore. We, uh, we don't need it because it's actually damaging us in so many ways. Now, um, so told, it's also important to acknowledge yeah, that many traditions have, not, have never been anthropocentric. But also, you know, to be fair, uh, some perspective, it might have been important also to recognize the human, especially at one point when, when the humans were at risk of extinction or anything, to give some strength to the, to the humans that were living in those hard times. Now, posthumanism does, like you said, uh, recognize the human as a fruit of this planet. In that sense, again, Taoism, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. You can think, for instance, of Alan Watts. He was a, a Taoist, uh, let's say, philosopher, uh, born in England. He moved to the US eventually. And I very much like his idea of the human as being um, 
he bring the example of the apples and uh, and the tree give apples and we never think of us as a fruit that comes out of the planet but we could very much think of us as that as for instance an apple is is a fruit of the planet we are fruits of the planet we are you know like we can only at the moment it might change in the future but at the moment we can only be born and flourish on planet earth so we are not just living on planet earth we are literally are born think again like a tree rooted in the earth system giving uh, uh, life and uh, generating apples so us as a species we eat the fruit the, 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 the food of this planet we breathe the oxygen the air of this planet uh, and in that sense you know we give and we, we take and we give so um yes posthumanism does not see the human as uh, the most uh, special creature the most uh, important one we need to be uh, and this in this sense is also not only a post slash humanism that is recognizing human diversity but also it's a post slash anthropocentrism which means that that yes it acknowledges that anthropocentrism was eventually part of the human narrative but it's also important to really go beyond that because it's not uh, is not helpful anymore it doesn't uh, it's actually damaging not only us we are living in what is called the anthropocene which is a an informal although it's geologists are discussing if this is going to be actually formally defined the the, the, the geological era in which in era in which we live but it's basically the geological era in which humans are not mm. seen anymore as one of many other species species but as a geological force which means a force that is actually changing the biosphere we are one of the causes of uh, many other non-human animal are getting extinct we are in the six mass extinction thousands of animals are getting extinct also because of human action so we can no longer see us as a separate you know not is not part of what's happening on planet earth we are considered a geological force we are geological we are shaping the human the, the planet and the human cannot be seen in separation also this shaping and this uh, uh, ecological distress is also reflecting on us think on the rise of for instance uh, cancer in every continent mm -hmm. even in the in the in, in my life uh, you know thinking of cancer the, the narrative of cancer when i was a child it was considered a tragedy people if people had cancer people would cry and you know like now mm -hmm. everyone has cancer some type of cancer think of skin cancer is so common mm -hmm. because of uh, climate change uh, think of the pandemics it's also a result of anthropocentric actions uh, of humans uh, dealing with non-human animals uh, mm -hmm. wherever whatever theory you are adopting doesn't matter if it was at the web market or at the lab does not matter it's still humans dealing with non-human animals without really giving uh, the, the right uh, space for uh, non for non-human wildlife so i think that at this point uh, it's really important for us as a species to acknowledge that we have to change our narrative that we need to change our social practices that we need to change laws that we need a real shift in our human consciousness as a species is not anymore just about some enlightened people here and there it's about mm. us as a species and we can do it we are living in the era of globalization you are in in india Subra. i'm in the us right now and it's only nine hours and a half uh, difference and we are talking and there are people connecting from all over right now we yes. can do it but we need to be first of all honest with what's happening we cannot close our eyes we cannot just say oh it's not a big deal it is a big deal because we are part of that because we are manifesting all of this it is a big deal we need to be honest we cannot be just you know like uh, depressed that doesn't help either and we cannot be just you know like a uh, uh, egocentric thing that we can just go on with this anthropocentric narrative that would be suicidal so i think that the way to go is about honesty intellectual honesty mm -hmm. existential honesty and this is going to be a great gift to us as a species to us as a planet and to us as individuals and this gift is going to be 
with us also in the moment of death. And it's not going to be the next PhD, it's going to be existential insights. And those are the most precious gifts that we can give ourselves as well. Very true, very true. Uh, moving on, uh, you have said in your lectures that philosophical posthumanism has three non-hierarchical and organically integrated layers, which are the plurality of humanity, the joyful recognition that the human is not the best species, and uh, third is non-binary and post-dualism. So are these the uh, three, the practices of post-humanism theory? Uh, would you please explain these? Thank you so much, Sura. Yes, yeah, so what happened is that, uh, uh, again, I was, I'm talking, you know, many years ago, between 10 and, you know, five years ago, the, when there was a lot of confusion, people at least had a very clear understanding of what transhumanism is, because transhumanism is very clear. Eh? As we mentioned, transhumanism wants human enhancement. Now, you may agree with it or not, but at least it's very clear what transhumanism wants. Uh, what posthumanists wanted, it was very unclear. So two things were happening. Or that everyone thought that posthumanists were just transhumanists and they would cause so much confusion. Or people say, okay, you're not a transhumanist, but what do you really want? And they mm. would get complicated. People giving half an hour answers with people falling asleep in the winter. Like, okay, very interesting, but <laughs> I don't get in that. So I was like, yes. okay, this is important and we need some clarity because that's not helping anyone. So I, uh, you know, I really thought about it and I came with this... Uh, Maybe it's an oversimplistic way to clarify what is posthumanism, but it, it definitely is a helpful tool. I'm not saying that it's uh, comprehensive in universal ways. I'm sure that it's going to be eventually, you know, someone can say, what about this? It's like, oh, yeah, great, let's add that. You know, so I'm not just saying that this is, you know, but at the moment, I think it does a good job explaining what is posthumanism. So I brought these three layers that are not hierarchical in the sense that you cannot have one without the others. And you cannot, it's not that you have to have one first and then the other and then the other. Mm? I'm just going to explain them in this way because I think they're a little in, more easier, easier to understand, at least for some people. Uh, mm. For other people, for instance, coming from non dual traditions in India, maybe it could be the other way. For them, it could be easier to understand post dualism first. But let's go in the way that I usually explain because, again, this philosophy, although definitely exceeds academia, is also being developed within academia. So same with the, you know, like I'm trying to also think of an audience that comes uh, from a, a, this kind of form of mentis. So in that sense, again, don't think of them in a way that this layer comes first and then the other, but think of them as three important layers, no matter where you start. Hmm? Anyway, the way that I usually explain is uh, starting, for instance, with post slash humanism. Post humanism asserts the importance of recognizing human diversity which means that in many traditions, the human has been universalized. So some humans, a group of humans, who eventually got into power for different reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. It could be military, it could be, you know, some type of hegemony in their society, for any reasons. They get into a position of power in their society and they start to define who is the human. And they start to describe and represent who is the human. And this comes, for instance, usually in, uh, in a way that is hierarchical. So the human, for instance, is this, that, and that. I bring a couple of examples, but you really see this in the history of humankind for, for a very long time, especially with the beginning of civilization, especially with the beginning of borders, especially with mm. the beginning of settlements and uh, urbanization. Is when humans, because before that, it's definitely everything is a little more shifting, fluid, Humans were nomads, so they were moving around. There were so many different tribes with different ideas. So I guess at the time, although we do see some common patterns, so the human um, worshipping nature in the female form, because the female give birth to both male and female, so the female is more of an all-embracing kind of force. But with the beginning of civilization, when you start to have settlements, urbanizations, cities, eventually borders, First of all, you start to have goods, even just crops that you need to safeguard because now you, you spend your whole year uh, taking care of your plants. You want to make sure that you're going to eat the fruit of those plants. Yes. Now you're going to have some more time, though, because you are not going to be constantly searching for a place to live, for, a, for food, f following animals. You have some free time. 
you're going to start to settle your your home start to build you know your 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 temples although some in some cases you have temple first and then urbanization some mm. cases for instance in turkey but you start to have settlements and you start to have borders when okay i worked on this land this is my land these are my crops and those are your lands and you start to have eventually the military coming out of trying to safeguard these areas now you're going to start to see civilization as what we are used to a little more in the 21st century borders identities nations in all of these in all of these you are start to see the construction of uh, a different form of identities when you are taught to define yourself are you hindu are you muslim are you christian are you female are you male are you black are you white are you european are you uh, asian are you african are you indian american all these categorizations they come with the construction of specific identities now if you take it as a part of the cosmic game it's not a big deal you're playing around that's fine if you take it too seriously that's when you really lo you lose insight first of all is when you see the other as your enemies because they are not you because they are not uh, white or they are not black or they are not hindu or they are not muslim or they are not christian and then you're going to see the other as the less than you and in this you see this a lot in human history the construction of the between little comma us as the human and between little comma others as the barbarians as the one that can be enslaved the ones that can be killed the history of genocide is based on the construction of the others and the less than human the human considered the us so in that sense it's very important for posthumanism to really realize and to be very loyal about this that the human is diverse in fact as uh, darwin clearly expressed through for instance the reading of stephen gold stephen gold underlines the fact that darwin evolution is not about complexity so it's not that we're getting better but we yeah. is about diversification in fact in the human pole the human pole is rich when it's very diverse the you know the inter, in, interbreeding between human families that's when you're going mm -hmm. to see a lot of genetic diseases so it's very important to recognize the human diversity is not only beautiful and fascinating and inspiring because it's part of our roots as as a species come to the developments of the arts apparently the arts is what allow us to coexist the social glue in those hard times during for instance the risk of extinction during the ice age now it's very important not only to recognize that but also the importance of human diversity genetically speaking so it's very important to recognize the first layer of humanity as a plural notion humans as as many not in any hierarchical way so you can uh, embrace a hindu approach an atheist approach a christian approach a muslim approach whatever it is fine if that location brings you insights bring you awareness go for it but do not judge others do not place yourself in contrast to others acknowledge also their perspectives and acknowledge the fact that they are also bringing unique insights to the conversation so that's the first layer the second layer is but not in a hierarchical way so you can start from the second layer mm. for instance people working with animal rights groups or uh, mm. you know uh, to work uh, uh, regarding speciesism uh, or uh, uh, deconstructing the it cover they start from there you know so i'm just saying you don't need first one and second the other but you need both and then i'm going to go to the third layer so you can start for instance by working you know about uh, non-human personhood and your point uh, it's to make clear that you know, at this age we really need to recognize uh, the importance of not seeing the human as the best species you, you know if you look at many documentaries about the humans it's pretty embarrassing they're all written by mm. humans they're all directed by humans and they describe the human as the best possible species the most intelligent one the most evolved one it was it was be like me writing about posthumanism as a posthumanist philosopher say oh posthumanism is the best uh, approach much better than anyone else and people say okay that's really interesting you're a posthumanist saying that come on that's ridiculous if anyone someone who is not a posthuman should say that so the same is like us as a species say that we are the best one 
I don't know if other species would say the same. I don't know if all the animals that are being, you know, like kept in, in farms to be killed, mm. to be eaten by humans would say that we are so good, you know? So just saying that this idea that we are the best, the most enlightened one, the most developed is very human centric, not only human centric, but written by humans, which is ridiculous. You know, if you are, if you, if some, if a, if a philosopher want, you know, is, if, is, if we're writing a, a biography of, uh, of um, uh, Gayatri Spiva, she's not the one writing that, someone else should write her own biography. Otherwise, it's like, okay, you're writing the, you know, like you are, I don't know, the most enlightened one, but it's not very serious if you are the one saying that. Someone else should talk about that. The same goes with the human. We cannot be the one saying that we are, you know, the most evolved, most intelligent, most enlightened. It's ridiculous. It's human centric and it's a little, it's like, it's very childish. Uh, no, I love children. I think they're the best. Let's not use this metaphor, <laughs> but yes. it's very <laughs> immature. Let's put it that way. Very immature. Immature. Yeah. Correct. yeah. Yeah, I think the children are very enlightened, like Nietzsche said, yeah, go back, you know, see that the world is a child. That's the really, you know, open way to look at it. So the children can really teach us a lot. But I'm saying that, uh, uh, so it's very important to really stop this construction of the human as, you know, this hierarchical notion of the human in which we are the most, the most, we're not. We are part of many other species, but we're not less. In that sense, for instance, posthumanism does not embrace uh, human extinction. Some groups, uh, uh, for instance, anti-human manifesto, Patricia, uh, Patricia McCormack da, uh, do. Uh, the posthumanist movement doesn't because for me, it would, be, uh, it would be still a way to locate the human in a hierarchical notion. Now you're not the plus, you are the minus, but you're still dealing with this hierarchy involved. So let's try to think of the human in more grounded ways. Let's start to think of the human as diverse. Not every human has been super anthropocentric. There are very enlightened mm. humans that are also being part of the conversation, they've been part of the human species. Let's acknowledge them. We have many very good examples, and India brings us a lot of good examples of enlightened humans as well. So I would say let's try not to play the game of human is the best or the worst, which mm. gone also in the idea of, you know, like now we have to read the re redemption of sin. Let's try to get out of this narrative. Let's try to be grounded let's, let's let's try to see the human as part of the conversation in connection to everything else that is happening and let's really deconstruct anthropocentrism right now reviewing all the laws reviewing all the social constructs reviewing all of our interactions and also of course of our diets and one more thing i want to say is the third layer which is a little harder to just explain in one minute which is post-dualism now, this is a really crucial one, though, because if we go into post-humanism as a post-humanism, if we go with post-anthropocentrism as a post-anthropocentrism, but if we keep dualism intact, we are always going to see issues. We need to deconstruct a dualistic vision of existence, because tomorrow may not be humans, we might not... Uh, uh, you know, like a treat, uh, we, we might not have uh, any more discrimination against humans. We may not have any more discrimination against human and non-human animals. But if we keep the dualistic paradigm intact, we are going to see other forms of discrimination. For instance, the whole notion of eight eye takeover, or maybe robot, robots discriminate against humans, or the other mm. way, humans ag uh, discriminating against you know uh, sentient robots. Uh, you know, this narrative that is, I think, it's. Uh, really unbelievable that is still accepted of talking of AI as our arti artificial slaves. Robots mm. come from robota, which is a Czech term from the Czech language, uh, which from the, um, from the writing R-U-R, uh, which actually means slave, robot, robot, robota, slave. Uh, now, we need to be very careful which kind of narratives are we constructing with technology, Technology is a way of revealing, is manifesting, and this is a Heideggerian reading of technology. I, I love it. It's a way of manifestation in the existential cosmic game or in the existential uh, unfolding. We need to acknowledge technology, but we can no longer read, uh, interpret, uh, accept ways of dealing with existence in dualistic terms. So let's try to get out of dualism of course, you know, there are many interesting non-dual traditions, but I also acknowledge that many societies have been constructing dualistic ways. So a lot of minds have been formed and been taught through dualistic tools. Since, you know, from not even day one that we were born, when we're still in the bellies 
of our mothers. People already find us a female, male, uh, Italian, Indian, uh, American. We have mm. been uh, dealing with constructing our own identity until, uh, even before we even come to this world. People already giving gifts, uh, pink for girls, uh, blue for boys, uh, um, all these different kind yes. of construction. So, of course, non-dual, of course, eventually existence is non-dual, but it's also very true that uh, nature and culture are completely co-creating each, each, each other, and we are coming out of a society that, is, that has been uh, constructing identity in very dualistic forms. So we cannot just jump to the non-dual, we first need to acknowledge our dualistic roots, uh, our dualistic practices, in order to deconstruct them. This is why I think post-dualism is necessary, and it's really important, and much more work needs to be done in the post-human field, because a lot of good work has been done on post humanism a lot of good work has been done on post slash anthropocentrism, although more needs to be done. But on post slash dualism, much more. We need many more intellectuals and sages and artists and scientists and uh, all kinds of people really uh, thinking about this and working with this and bringing new insights and perspectives to the conversation. Thank you. So, since you mentioned speciesism, uh, speciesism is very related to post humanism. But uh, speciesism has changed quite a lot from when it first originated in the 1970s. Uh, now it does not only include the genealogical species, that is the living or organisms, but includes robots and AI gadgets as well. So can you explain the logic, uh, this lo logic for this and its necessity? And if I may add, is speciesism born out of an unarticulated fear that someday the AI gadgets may take over the human species and do to us what we have done to the lesser species so far? Thank you so much, Sura. Great question. Yes, uh, you're right. Uh, let's uh, talk about speciesism. Uh, let's also say that, uh, as you said, this term was coined in the 70s, in a very interesting historical time, uh, in a time where the historical universal notion of the human was deconstructed by so many different groups of people. Mm? In this time, you have, for instance, feminism, who says, well, the human has been defined as male in the whole history of philosophy, for instance, and is not, you know, we have many, and of course, not only female, but you have the rainbow of genders that comes eventually out of that conversation. You have the whole discussion of race. It is very still uh, an important aspect to deconstruct and uh, look at the important work that has been done right now with uh, the movement of Black Lives Matter. You have the whole discussion on post-colonialism, uh, you know, that uh, says, well, this uh, construction of the identity has been formed on uh, imperial powers. And you also have a very interesting uh, approach they come, for instance, for, uh, at the time, uh, animal rights activism. They say we need to add to the whole deconstruction of the human. And if you're not familiar with this deconstruction, deconstructing the way the human has been formed through also the uh, non-human others. In fact, mm -hmm. in this dualistic approach, according to which some humans were considered better than others, the non-human animal was there since the very beginning of the construction of the notion of the human, even you can go back, for instance, to the notion of the anthropos, and the human was also the one who was not a non-human animal. This uh, diversity was not uh, neutral. The human was the plus. The non-human was the minus. The human was the civilized, was the logos, was language, was also male and white and Western, etc., etc. But definitely was, was, was a human. The non-human animal was connected to uh, nature, to uh, barbarian, to, uh, to be tamed uh, and to the lesser than human, uncivilized, before the logos, before the language. Now, uh, this is a very old concept. It doesn't apply to all the traditions, uh, definitely doesn't. But definitely it's been part of uh, many, many traditions uh, and it's important to acknowledge. Uh, of course, for instance, if you think about something like shamanism, uh, in shamanism is very different because in shamanism you partake in the spirit, but you have different bodies. So shamanic traditions that are actually all over planet Earth, they come from a very ancient idea of the human, uh, perception of the human, that also is related to us roots, uh, to our ancestors eh, in all continents, is about the human as only one of many possible forms of the spirit. They can be human or human spirits, etc., uh, etc., et plants, etc., etc. 
But let's go back now to your question. So in the 70s, there is this discussion about, uh, well, we're not only talking about this different type of privileges that are based on gender, on sexual orientation, on race, on ethnicity, on case, on nationality, on religion, and blah, blah, blah. We're also talking about a specific species. In fact, uh, apart from all these other type of uh, supremacy, you have the supremacy of, for, for instance, humans being entitled to kill and treat the way they want all other non-human animals. And so you have a very interesting conversation. It starts at the time, we comes also with a real activist approach, which is the whole animal rights movement. Uh, so that's a very important uh, passage that also, of course, is part of the genealogy of the posthuman. Now, as you were mentioning, the notion of speciesism doesn't just apply to deconstructing the privilege of human over non-human animals, but it also apply to deconstructing the privilege of biological beings towards non-biological beings and vice versa. In fact, at the moment, we have a specific construction which is, has been defined as the uh, hypothetical scenario of AI takeover, which stands yes. for artificial intelligence taking over. And there are many people, also bright people, really uh, bringing more fire to the sphere. The idea that eventually, very soon, uh, technology is going to be in charge of uh, human governments. Uh, we're not going to have a presidential election between two human beings. We might have a presidential election between two different algorithms, uh, big data, which is all happening, it's true. And we are, we are in the era of big data. The conversation that we are having is not only benefiting, I hope, some humans, but it's also going to bring a lot of data to the big realm and still a bit unknown to many of big data in which we are not just what we say, but we are bits of information, the sounds of our voices, uh, the, the, the colors behind the, in my background, all this is data. No matter what, the way I type on my computer, this is all data. Everything is data. Mm? So that definitely is happening. But uh, the, 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 the dualization and the formation of the typical human narrative is being reapplied to all these important reflections that we should have. So instead of thinking about real what's happening, like, you know, what about privacy? What about, uh, uh, you know, the rights for maybe to uh, access to internet? What about uh, uh, digital control? What about all these very important questions that we need to address because that's happening? We're asking, I think, the wrong question. We are saying, oh, what if, you know, the robots take over and kill us all and, uh, and they, they do what we did to all the other species? Mm -hmm. So I think it's the wrong question to ask because, first of all, it's repeating the same uh, type of narrative that we are trying to deconstruct as posthumanists. So for me, it's not so much the fear of uh, robots coming and kill me because I killed, you know, uh, other non-human animals is that we should not be killing non-human animals to begin with. Because we are all with non-human animals and robots and AI and all kinds of diversity of humans. We are all together in this existential quest. Now, if you do not like the notion of the spirit from the shamanic tradition, which is not only shamanic tradition, it comes back to the Paleolithic time, let's think of this as existential quest. We are in this together. We no longer think of us just as us. We are learning through, for instance, the internet. We are exchanging information through our iPhones or, or cell phones or emails. We are right now with you in a digital conversation that could have not happened 20 years ago. Yes. Technology is changing the way we exist. We need to acknowledge that. Uh, it, it, it is predicted that if there was no uh, internet connection there was no internet, no technology for uh, 15 days, one third of the population would die because a lot of the exchanges of food, uh, water supplies, and all kinds of things is happening through technology. So it's uh, kind of uh, naive to say, oh, let's just go back to a pre-technological era in which we were all happy. It's, uh, it's uh, again, a linear history of time in which we can just jump back to the past, and that's not really for me to be loyal to the history of humankind. We are uh, manifesting with technology. It's important to make sure that this manifestation does not unfold in a typical dualistic frame of a specific society that plays war as a solution of human conflicts. Because if we go into that narrative, 
I'm sorry to tell to the people who are very dualistic, is not going to end well for the humans. If we're going to the narrative, yes, it's possible that AI may take over and say, you know what, we may no longer need these humans, and they're not going to be that buyer. Just, you know, stop the food supplies eventually with, you know, an intelligent network 200 years from now or 100 years from now or 80 years from now. But that's not the point that I'm trying to make. I'm trying to make here the point that it's not about who is the better, who is the best, who is the new owner of everyone, who is the new god, or who is the new master. The point is going beyond the dialectic master slash slave dialectic. Because in that dialectic, there is no winner. The slaves had a very terrible time, and the master did too. It's interesting, for instance, in, in the history of African-American slavery, when you read the, uh, both sides, of course, the African-American had a really brutal experience, and that should not happen to any human ever. But it's also true that the master who thought they were in power, they were constantly concerned about being poisoned. And they would happen. Slaves, sure enough, mm. they would uh, bring their vengeance in the ways they could. They were working in the kitchen. They would uh, bring uh, glass, make a very thin power, put in the food. And yes, of course, you're, mm. going to bring, you're going to get back what you put out. If you put hate, you're going to get hate. And the history of uh, tradition of karma in the India, India tradition. Karma is just action that brings action. It's the result. So we need to step out of the master slave dialectics that has not always been there because in fact, slavery starts with civilization. In fact, when humans were nomads for 99% of human history, Paleolithic time, huge chunk of time, we, we never study because it doesn't go along with what we are used to now. Humans, there were very few instances of temporary type of slavery here and there. There is not a normativization of slavery because humans were too busy surviving and helping each other. When you are trying to survive, you're not going to be busy killing each other or enslaving each yes. other. So it's very important that we are not going to go back to this uh, dualizing, hierarchical, master-slave dialectic with technology. We have many other examples of human coexistence for hundreds of thousands of years. Let's bring other examples to the conversation. Let's try to, his to study history, really be loyal to our, uh, our ancestry, because history does not start with Mesopotamia. And of course, Mesopotamia is an interesting time, but there's much more to that. And if we only start with the history of civilization, we start with the history of slavery, start with the history of borders, start with the history of many other things. We need to acknowledge civilization in the good things they brought, but we also need to acknowledge there are many more examples that we can bring to the history of humankind. Let's focus on how can we coexist instead of how can we kill each other. And when we're trying to shift our, our, our paradigm, that's when we realize that we are not at war with technology. We are co-creating each other and we are unfolding in the big existential quest that is our existence. Our existence, your existence, in relation to my existence, in relation to technology, non-human animals, and the planet, and Mars, and much more. Right. So uh, since we are talking about power and post-humanism and transhumanism, uh, we cannot but talk of cyborgs. So that... Now we have the cyborgs and the chimeras demonstrating that we don't need to be men or women or white or black or man or machine to be powerful. Power starts to exist everywhere. And the other thing is that the semantic demarcation between human beings and cyborgs have blurred. Since the term was uh, coined for the first time in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 1968 by Manfred Klein and Nathan Klein, we have been using science and technology to enhance human performance for a long time. We use things like eyeglasses, prosthetic limbs and exoskeletons, all kinds of implants, collagen injections, plastic surgery, and even pacemakers. So what is that which really makes us a cyborg? Technology that we use outside to enhance our performance or technology that we use inside our bodies in tandem with our biological system? If you please answer that. Thank you so much, Sura. Uh, very important question. So you're right. We've been talking about how the human construction of the identity has been based on very dualistic uh, type of format. If you are uh, from this nation, you're not supposed to be from that nation, although, of course, there is dual citizenship. But in general, if you're one, you're not the other. If you are a female, you are supposed not to be male, although, of course, we see now the flourish in all these different type of genders. Now, it's very interesting that in uh, 1985, uh, Donna Haraway wrote this uh, short text, uh, which is called uh, A Manifesto for Cyborgs, 
which eventually really expanded beyond academia and now is a text that is considered very, very influential, in which he says, uh, let's try to change the terms of the discussion. Why about, uh, why, why instead, for instance, of going for identity, why don't think of affinity? In fact, we are all cyborgs already. Eh? In the 21st century, we are already all cyborgs. Now, of course, what does it mean to be a cyborg? You're right, the term itself did not come from Donna Haraway. It was uh, coined in this text, uh, 1960, of, uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the history of space migration, uh, and it was the conjunction of cyb for cybernetic and yes. org for organism yes. by, Chris and Cli by Klein and Clives. And they were talking about humans who were going to go to space and they could not yes. survive if they just went with their organism. They needed technology. In fact, if you go on the moon or on Mars, you cannot just go with yes. your own body because you're going to be uh, dying, you need to breathe, you're going to need technology in order to survive on uh, planet Mars, on uh, anywhere in space, pretty much. There might be some cases in which there are, there are um, there would be oxygen, but in general, uh, you know, all the places we've been as a species, uh, including Mars, where we went with robots, robots are there already, not humans yet, uh, but we need technology. So they were saying, well, the only way humans can survive outside of planet Earth is through technology. This is why is by let's say becoming cyborgs, cyb again cybernetic or right. organism, emerging of that. Now uh, it's very interesting because in the nineties, after Donna Haraway reflection, uh, there was a whole uh, flourishing of what has been called cyborg studies, and a lot of experiments as well going on at the time. On one side, this notion really uh, influenced a lot of people saying, uh, well, we are all cyborgs. We are merging more and more with technology. Like you said, even the use of glasses can make us cyborgs. And some people say, well, guess what? Philosophically speaking, paleontologically speaking, humans are technological beings. In fact, in paleontology, for instance, you describe humans as those animals. They create tools out of tools. Now, this is done by other non-human animals, a couple of other non-human animals, but they kind of keep it limited. Humans really expanded upon the, to the point that almost pretty much whatever you see around yourself right now is made by humans. Uh, I mean, uh, or has been designed by humans. Even trees in a city have been designed to be there, uh, unless you go to uh, unique places where humans are, have not really interfered, and I hope that we as a species recognize the importance of, of having places where humans are not inter interfering and create a lot of uh, uh, planetary uh, parks where non-humans uh, are can flourish and humans are not allowed because we are taking way too much space. But let's go back to our uh, question. So the cyber, well, I'm going to connect this though. Um, so there was a whole discussion. So what make a cyborg? And for instance, there were very interesting uh, experiments. I, I had the uh, great opportunity to work with uh, uh, Kevin Warwick, for instance, who is considered by many the first human cyborg. In fact, he was the first human to insert inside of his organism a microchip, which entailed that he, this is in, 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 at the beginning of 2000, he would get inside of the university, a Reading, uh, Reading University, and the and the computers would recognize him without him having to log in, for instance, to the email account and would just say, good morning, Professor Warwick. So the microchip would allow him to be recognized by the technological system inside of the, um, of the university. And he did other experiments as well. Well, for instance, connected uh, his uh, biological hand to the microchip. Uh, he was based at Columbia University in New York City to a robotic hand that was actually at Reading University in England. So he experimented a lot. And there are other cases, uh, for instance, the Iborg, uh, this uh, artist from uh, Spain who also uh, uh, lived in, in the US, and he had added an antenna in order to feel colors because he was born, uh, born uh, colorblind. So there are people who say, well, to be a cyborg is not enough to use uh, external technology, because if you look at it, we've always been doing that as a species. Mm. Think of the use of fire and the cooking, yes. for instance. Those are technologies. But 
they say, well, first of all, it should be inside of, of the body, and also it should expand what has been considered, historically speaking, human. So for instance, uh, some people say, well, people with a pacemaker, for instance, are cyborgs, because you need specifically what we were talking with uh, clients and clients, a piece of technology in order to survive. In fact, someone with a pacemaker need technology in order to uh, have the survival of their own biological body. But some people say, well, but that is still part of the history of the human. But again, it's debated. But some people say in order to be a cyborg, you need to go beyond what is being historically human. So for instance, Kevin Warwick says, I am, I could be considered the first human cyborg. He wrote a book or I cyborg is the title because mm -hmm. I use this technology to go beyond what has been considered historically human. For instance, having technology recognizing me through the use of my microchip inside of my body. And it's also very interesting that the body, in this case, totally recognized the microchip of his own. And after he took the microchip off, he actually did, he didn't leave it inside. Uh, there were all veins uh, that were uh, growing, that grow uh, on the microchip itself. So the body mm. recognized it as part of his body, in this case. In other case, we don't still know what kind of impact does a microchip have uh, on the biological body? So there are also some cases of uh, cancer grow close to the microchip. So I guess the body, different bodies react in different ways. But let's go back to our point. Uh, there was also a counter discussion to this, which was very interesting, which was based, for instance, um, in India. Uh, and the point was uh, uh, Vandana Shiva uh, gave a very interesting criticism. Dr. Shiva says, uh, said in the 90s, and it's still part of our conversation, well, if we embrace this approach in which we're all cyborgs, there is a big issue here, because only one species gets some benefits, which is the human, who is the one who is constructing the whole narrative about the cyborg. In fact, in this kind of narrative, if we're all cyborgs, if we're all chimeras, then you can only accept, for instance, bioengineering, uh, genetic engineering, GMOs. And she says the only species who gets any benefits out of these are humans. So she says, very careful not to fall for just, you know, the uh, uh, blind acceptance of uh, the notion of the cyborg. And sorry, if I, I don't want to use blind in an in a, uh, ableist way. People who are blind can see much better than many other people because you can see through other senses. And same when, you know, blind in the sense that not understanding, uh, not really understanding the planetary condition. So Dr. Shiva says, let's be very careful with this narrative of the cyborg because it only benefits one species, which is the human. And so does uh, genetic engineering. It only benefits not only one species, but few humans within a species. Some, for instance, in her case, she really constructs the whole uh, capitalist approach to uh, biotechnologies uh, and uh, how they are really based on capitalism. And it's not really, you know, she, she does a very good job showing that, you know, the patenting of GMOs, et cetera, et cetera. It's really about money, it's not really, you know, the golden rice to bring vitamin E to, you know, population, vitamin A to the population. So um, I would say the subject is a very interesting point. We should definitely keep to the conversation, especially because it helps us navigating the strict history of identity. I like the notion of affinity that helps us bridge with others instead of closing from others. But I also want, want to acknowledge the criticism done by, for instance, post-colonialism by Dr. Shiva saying, be careful with this because it really comes with a speciesist assumption and a speciesist privilege. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. So, uh, but we also have to accept that uh, due to the development of the technology, we can be in multiple places at the same time through digital platforms and even have different personas of the same person over different platforms all at the same time. Uh, I have in mind the Hollywood movie Avatar, where a person who cannot walk becomes another kind of a person, even species, who is quite mobile uh, in a parallel existence. Now, if we really reach that stage, will we be complicating or simplifying things? And what do you think will be its moral and ethical implications? Thank you so much, Surab. That's an excellent question. In this sense, I want to acknowledge my 
transhumanist colleagues. Unfortunately, there is no too much dialogue between uh, all these different communities. Each community kind of bring their own insights, which are very precious. And sometimes these communities are actually just kind of uh, mildly criticizing each other without getting into the dialogue. I think uh, that uh, it's very important to be in dialogue with all of these movements because each movement brings specific insights with also of their own limits. Now, something that for me, Transhuman is very uh, good at is envisioning possibilities for the future, uh, for the close future. Don't uh, think of this just a futurism. That's a different approach of course, futurism is connected to transhumanism, but transhumanism is not really talking about far future. It's talking about very close future, near future, already who we are right now. Uh, now, I do not consider myself a transhumanist, I consider myself a posthumanist, but I do acknowledge many important insights that come from the transhumanist movement. In this sense, I want to bring, for instance, the work of Natasha Vitamore to the conversation. She's, been, she's an artist and she's also been, um, you know, like working with the, the whole transhumanist movement since the 90s. She's one of the founders of the movement. She's also a, a philosopher. She is uh, redesigning your redesign of human through nanotechnology. Okay, I think there is, okay. I think there is I'm some, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. sure. My no avatar problem. left, which is great because I'm just talking about this. Another word that I would like to work uh, to mention <laughs> is the word, <laughs> exactly, is my avatar took a little time to pause, a little breathing. All right, the other uh, artist that I would like to mention here is Stellark, who also mentioned a possibility in which, you know, at the moment we have this uh, virtual uh, world, which is uh, called Second Life, in which we have uh, physical humans, biological humans, have different avatars on Second Life. But he says, what about a third life in which you have avatars having different biological bodies out in the physical world? Now, let's go back to your question. The point here is that uh, these movements, uh, specifically transhumanism, is very good at reflecting on possibilities. Like you said, what if a close future in which I don't have just one body, I have many, not only virtual ones, but maybe, maybe as uh, uh, stellar is envisioned, maybe even different biological bodies. Now, I, I think it's an important question. We can already answer that, of course, through the way we're living our life nowadays and where we come from. In fact, for instance, if you look at many traditions, our dream bodies, you know, where we are at when we're dreaming, is already a different, different kind of body that we experience every single night. Every single night, we uh, have a different uh, experience through our consciousness. And this experience in many traditions, uh, the Hindu tradition, for instance, but also the Buddhist tradition, for instance, Tibetan Buddhism, is as relevant to human consciousness as our experience in the physical body. Eh? So, for instance, Advaita Vedanta talk about the importance of acknowledging human consciousness to all these experiences. They go from the awake state, the dream state, and the non-dream state. So these are all part of the experience of being human, and it's impacting our consciousness. In fact, we can still remember some dreams from when we were kids. Or in fact, many mm. ancient societies, and still shamanistic society, really give a really huge importance to dreams. Because in the dream, our bodies, plural, can experiment and connect in different ways. So we can say that we already have many different bodies. Or you can bring other examples, the hypothesis of the multiverse, where maybe we are existing in different types of realms through different vibrational ranges. So, of course, we can say that that's already happening. And, of course, with av avatars. When we go to sleep, our mm. avatar on uh, Facebook, uh, our email is still present, and we still get emails, people connecting with us through all these uh, other uh, uh, digital selves that are part of who we are. So we are still alive, even if we're sleeping. Uh, someone may watch a video that we uh, have recorded. Our presence is there through the, uh, to the digital data, to the big data. Eh? So this is very important to think of, of course, as you said, in not only existential terms, but ethical terms. And uh, the questions that you ask are uh, very important. 
So what about ethics? What about ethics of bodies? And what about drones ethics? Think, for instance, of the military right now. Some people do not need to go to war anymore and uh, be at physical uh, conflict with someone. They must send a drone and kill someone like a video game without ev having no physical co contact. Uh, they are in front of a screen like we are right now and uh, having a moving a drone and with that drone killing physical bodies in other countries with also a lot of civilian casualties that often happen through this kind of drone wars that are happening right now. This is not the future. It's already happening, the ethics of, uh, ethics of drones and how, for instance, this is an extension of the human body because it's the human moving these drones from a platform, technological platform. So, of course, this is a huge question. And this is why I really uh, urge people not to think the self in limited ways, but see themselves, ethically speaking, in through this extended way of themselves as networks, uh, in the way we exist through the use of, for instance, uh, video games. Uh, if you're actually talking with drone, it makes it much more real. That's not just a video mm. game. You're actually killing real people. Uh, what about you know, the ethics of us in our mail exchanges, in our uh, Facebook interactions, in our social media interactions, in the way we talk to the others, in the way we think, in the way we dreams? In that sense, I really like to go to the core of philosophy as a love for wisdom and to the core of ethics, this comes from Greek, ethos, habits of existence, how we exist in our life, to all our bodies, our uh, dream bodies, our digital bodies, uh, our words that are also a manifestation of our thoughts in our interactions with others. So thank you so much for uh, these important questions. Okay, uh, and perspectivism uh, believes that every knowledge is situative and it comes from a specific experience, specific perspective. How is it related to posthumanism? And also, do you see posthumanism as akin to feminism, postmodernism, and postcolonialism in the sense that all these are counter discourses that challenge and deconstruct the grand narrative? Thank you so much for your question. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there are uh, many things to be said to this question. The first one is that I do uh, epistemologically speaking and ontologically speaking, and I don't want the people who are uh, listening to that, us getting lost. Epistemology simply means how do you get your knowledge? And it comes from Greek episteme, logos, the discourse on episteme. How do you get your knowledge? And ontology is the discourse on being. What is this in which we are all, in which we are all together? And eh? what is ontos, being? The discourse on being. So uh, let's, uh, uh, from an epistemological and ontological perspective, I do see posthumanism as a perspectivism. There are many uh, philosophical references we can have here. In the Western tradition, of course, you can think of Nietzsche. But for instance, in many other traditions, Jainism, for instance, in India, talk of perspectivism. Amerindian cosmologists talk of perspectivism. So what is this? Simply speaking, it means that everyone, and literally everyone, when you go from a post-anthropocentric approach, everyone experience existence from a specific perspective. And in this sense, of course, this goes very well with feminism, uh, feminist epistemology, situated knowledges, which is very much in tune with this. So let's explain what it is. It means that right now, the way I am experiencing this moment, the way I'm experiencing this uh, uh, video conference, for instance, is different from the way you are experiencing these video conferences. Mm -hmm. What you see around in the background, what you see right now in the camera, uh, your computer, the, the air you're breathing, uh, the water you are drinking, uh, the way you're hearing sound is different. Now, both our presences are manifesting this moment with everything else around us, all the people who are listening to us, the world that it is, uh, non-human animals, the planet that is moving in a specific way, the sun that is there. Everything is uh, merging in this specific moment in order 
for this specific moment, moment to manifest the way it is. But the way we perceive it comes from a specific perspective, which is related to embodiment. Now, this is not to be taken as ultimate. In that sense, if you think through physics, the strings, quantum strings, or the atoms, or whatever you want to think in the physics that are creating me is also creating anything around me as well. So in that sense, uh, is uh, that we are in this unfolding of existence together, but we are perceiving from a specific perspective, which is related to our embodiments, to our perspective, to our uh, special, uh, special temporal situation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, think of the ocean, though. Don't think of this as ultimate location that become our identities. Now, I cannot understand you because I am embodied in my body than I am right now in New York and blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. The type of perspective is, is co-creating existence the same as you being located in India. You are co-creating existence, but we will always be in this together as in the ocean. We are like waves in the oceans. And again, if you think of all the traditions that come out of the human consciousness and experience from all the Paleolithic time to the shamanic tradition is the, the idea of the spirit that is unfolding in different bodies. So the shaman is the one who can have access to that because they, they, they don't get caught in seeing them just as their embodiment. Although that embodiment is a location of power because it gives you specific qualities and characteristics. So as for instance, embodying as a human give me the gift of language in the way I can communicate right now in this form. If you know other non-human animals are communicating through themselves and others and us in different ways. So it's the idea that every type of existence is situated, come from a specific special temporal location, every kind of knowledge is come from a specific perspective, but it's not relative. And in that sense, it's not possible, it's not a relativism, which is more a, a, an approach that was uh, developed in the 70s. In the sense, everything is, is irrelative, so it doesn't really matter if I kill someone or I don't, because everything is relative. Well, I don't want to, this is, of course, is the exaggeration of that, you know? Uh, or a relativ a relativism can only come from the dualism with absolute, eh? so something, can be understood as relative if something else is understood as absolute. So I'm getting out of that kind of dichotomy. I, this is not a relativism, as much as it's not an absolutism. It's a perspectivism. So acknowledging every perspective is unfolding, and this recognition is mutual. So it's not that I'm recognizing you, but you can not recognize me. It's a mutual recognition of uh, coexistence. In the ocean, the waves are coexisting, co-emerging, and they're all part of the ocean. Ocean, of course, is a metaphor for the calm in many traditions. The Upanishads, for instance, talk about these yes. waves as, as a beautiful metaphor for existence. Okay, uh, uh, and uh, my final question today would be, post humanism philosophy seems to be uh, politically correct and socially relevant. Is it a conscious law to be in vogue, or is it naturally a part of its praxis to make sense of the turbulent world order in the present times, and perhaps the only way out for a better future? Your comments on that, please. Thank you so much. Yes, um, you're right in the sense that posthumanists can be seen as being politically correct, although I would really not assimilate the two. To be politically correct means that you are part of a system that has not been politically correct at all for thousands of years and is starting to acknowledge the issues that have created in the uh, injustice that has been unfolding in these kind of systems. So, for instance, uh, racism, sexism, uh, classism, uh, ethnocentrism, nationalism, etc., etc. Now, uh, to be politically correct, like in, inviting societies to the point of having laws where you need to be politically correct can be helpful for a society that is still imbued and embedded in very uh, dualistic, discriminatory frames. So, of course, 
we should make sure that a society has laws that allow everyone to feel dignified. So yes, we should be uh, having laws against racism, against sexism, against ethnocentrism, against uh, uh, you know all kind of uh, ableism, all kind of discriminations, because everyone is uh, uh, is not only as the, the 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 right to existential dignity, but everyone is uh, um, bringing their vision to the manifestation of existence. Now I'm saying this because. On one side, of course, you need laws that protect every human being. And I'm not only talking about human being, of course, I'm also expanding, but let's say now with the social construction and about human dignity. But it's also important to realize that this should not be done just to be politically correct. In this sense, posthumanism is an ontological way of looking at ethics. Because when you realize that you are part of everything, and in this, again, the Upanishads are a great uh, a source of teaching. When you realize that you are not separate from the others, any kind of discrimination other people suffer, their experience become part of the human consciousness at the conscious and unconscious level and becomes part of you with all its trauma. Trauma becomes part of your experience, not only on the social level, so a society where there is a lot of racism, sexism, is a society where there is a lot of violence, uh, domestic violence, uh, outside violence, uh, gunshots, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So of course this is a reflection of the types of society we are uh, uh, living if we do not respect the dignity of all the humans that are emerging in these societies. And of course this can apply to all the other discourses where even before about non-human animals and technology. But let's say for one you know, time about the, 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 the politically correct, which is usually used to address humans, although I really hope that it's going to be also used to address non-human beings as well, to be correct in our uh, interaction with non-human animals. Now, in that sense, what is ethics? Ethics becomes your realization that whatever you're going to experience as an individual, but also the society is going to affect your own existence, your own consciousness. You as a network, as a rhizome connected to all these layers, mm -hmm. you as an individual, as the people you hang out with, your families, your ancestors, your, your society, your nation, your continent, your planet, your, your cosmic system. So in that sense, if you want to have a just society, it's not just because you are a good-hearted person. It's because you understand that a good society that acknowledge the dignity of every being is going to be a good society for you to unfold, for you to experience, for you to manifest. And keep in mind that the only thing that is going to stay with you is not your possessions, is not your children, is not your husband and wife and lovers, it's not your jobs, it's not your academic titles, it's not your books, it's your phenomenologic, phenomenological experience, it's your consciousness. And that is a, an experience that is connected to all these layers. So going back to our initial questions, is posthumanism politically correct? It's definitely not against it, because of course, society should embrace political correctness to allow everyone to feel welcome, but it doesn't do these things to be politically correct, does embrace coexistence and existential dignity because we realize not only that we're all part of this together, but we're all different. And in, it is through the difference that we are really playing the cosmic game with, with joy and, 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 and dignity and, uh, and that we realize that we are waves in the big ocean of existence. Thank you. So that is it. We have come to the end of a very fruitful session. And I'm sure our listeners have been greatly benefited by your wisdom. We call it a day here. I thank you once again, ma'am, for giving us so much of your precious time. And sign off till we meet again. So it's goodbye and take care. Sura, I would like to thank you so much, all the people who are following us. And also, let's uh, say that this is a movement that is happening. There are many ways to keep connected. If you're interested a little more in the 
theory of it. There is a book that I wrote, Philosophical Posthumanism, paperback, it's a good price, affordable. Also, we have a platform called the Global Posthuman Network, which you can find at posthumans.org. We have many, many networks that are flourishing, the Latin American network, the Chinese network, the Indian network, the Australasian network, the Italian network, Turkish network, a lot, a lot of networks happening. So please connect with us. And also, if you want to connect with me more specifically, I have a website called theposthuman.org. So it's always great you know, to hear from all of you. Surab, thank you so much for the wonderful work you're doing, connecting all these thinkers and all these perspectives to the conversation. Thank you so much for thank your you, beautiful thank questions you. and for your time. Thank you. Thank you for thank your you. kind words. I will be connected with you. I hope my viewers will be too. You have answered the question so beautifully that we have got a very good grasp on the subject by this time. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, you so once much, again. Sura. You have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.